program, we are live uh, and participants are streaming in. So Daniel, take it away. All right, welcome everyone to our second episode in our three-part uh, installment of Above and Below Monterey Bay. My name is Daniel, and I'm a California State Park interpreter here at Point Lobos State Natural Reserve. And I'm always proud to show the patch. Now, we've got a very special program planned ahead of us. But before we get to that, Let's begin with where we were last week, over here at Whaler's Cove. Come along with me, let's take a short hike. Last week, you'll recall that we were out on the kelp kayak, checking out the canopy, the very top of the giant brown kelp forest. And that happens to be right on over here. All right, now that we're on the trail, got a mask on up. All right. There we go. Look at that. Whaler's Cove, Point Lobos State Natural Reserve, located just south of the town of Monterey. And consequently, just south of the Monterey Bay itself. We were out there exploring last week. We were looking at the kelp up close, talking about how it grows and photosynthesizes, looking for animals that depend upon the kelp forest, and also talked about our protections here at Point Lobos, it being a California State Reserve, as well as a Marine Protected Area, or an MPA for short. Now, we'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment, but what I'd like to do is just step back and let you take in this glorious scene The air temperature is about 65 degrees and still, not much of a breeze at all. I did measure the water temperature earlier this morning and on the surface, it was 54 degrees, which is great for the giant kelp and the nutrients that it needs and all the life that depends upon it. Now today, we're gonna get a chance to experience some of that life. You might recall from last week that um, above and below, Monterey Bay is a collaboration of organizations that have a similar interest in education and the environment. And those uh, partners that we are partnering up with include uh, Monterey, Monterey County Office of Education, Monterey Bay Q, which is Monterey Bay Computer Using Educators, and our friends over at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, today, we're going to take a field trip from Point Lobos over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and see what's going on there in their kelp forest exhibit. So last week, we got to see the top of the kelp forest. Now we're going below, and we get a chance to see what's inside of that kelp forest, the various life forms that are there that depend upon that kelp forest for their food, for their shelter, for helping in their migration, or whatever the case may be for that particular animal and its relationship with the kelp forest. Now I wanna make sure I check our time to, you know, so we, things go ac according to plan because we have, like I said, our friends at the Monterey Bay Aquarium will be joining us in just a moment. And our friend in particular known as Patrick Webster, who I consider kind of a local hero and a, and a you know, just a kind of a, a local character as well. Um, no. Who, <laughs> yeah, who, uh, uh, <laughs> has done a lot in education for our marine resources, from you know, underwater photography to incredible social media that we get to see through the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And so Patrick, are you, are you there? Can we, can we? Hey, can hey we, Daniel, can yeah, I can see you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Patrick Webster, everybody, you're right there before your very eyes. Oh goodness, oh, stop. I'm glad I'm gonna have a full face mask here to hide the blushing just a little bit there, Daniel. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name's Pat. I'm over here on top of our kelp forest. So Daniel, I'm kind of looking at a similar view to you on top of the water here, but this is 
behind the scenes here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium on top of the kelp forest exhibit. This was the first exhibit in the world to exhibit a living, growing kelp forest when it opened in 1984. And actually, it opened October 20th, 1984. And so today is our 36th birthday here at the aquarium, Daniel. So uh, very wow. excited to share this, uh, this, this very special day with all of you folks out there. Happy birthday, Monterey Bay Aquarium. Yeah, we did it. 36 years. And uh, the really amazing thing here about this exhibit is uh, I get to dive into this completely different world. It's the, you know, from behind you there, Daniel, when people visit the aquarium, sometimes if you haven't seen that kelp forest yet, you see that canopy and you're wondering, well, what's that weird brown stuff there on the surface? And it's that majestic forest that goes down uh, beneath the waves there. And we actually have that here at the aquarium. So um, in just a few minutes here, I'm, I'm actually just saying hello here topside. I'm going to put on the rest of my dive gear and then I'm going to see you from underwater in the kelp forest exhibit here in just uh, just a few minutes. So, um, yeah, can't wait to show you folks what's underneath the water here in our very own kelp forest. Wonderful. Thank you, Patrick. And we'll see you in a few minutes. In a few minutes. All right. We'll let you know when we're ready. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Perfect. Take it away. I'll see you underwater. All right. Excellent. All right, everyone. Wow. Super exciting. So as Patrick said, we're going to go into the kelp forest and check out what's there. Now, before we just met up with Patrick, we were talking about what we did last week, learned about the kelp and the animals that depend upon it and the protections that we put upon this area known as our marine protected area. And, it, you know, although there are many different types or a few different types of marine protected areas, the one right here is a simple one to define. And that's a no take zone, a no take zone. And it sounds and it is exactly what it sounds like, an area where everything natural and living remains. We don't take anything out of here, no fishing or hunting or collecting. And because of that, we're afforded a lot of biodiversity. A lot of different types of life are here in our kelp forest. Come along with me. And I want to uh, you know, show you a few things right on over here. We're going to take a short walk, kind of a little bit out of the way over here. And... Our MPA here um, goes back a long time. Point Lobos uh, is 87 years old on land as a park and about 70 years in the water. So we became an underwater park in about 1960. So one of the oldest underwater parks or marine protected areas in our nation, if not the world. So, and I mentioned that that's a no-take zone. Now that we're off the trail a bit, we can take off our mask. All right. So our no take zone, oh, excuse me for a moment. There we are. One of my favorite animals that is in the kelp forest is the animal that belongs to this shell right here. Beautiful. I discovered this right here at Point Lobos, and I wanted to share it with everyone. This flattened sea snail known as the red abalone is a kelp eater. It's also eaten by the otter, among other animals. Now, maybe the otter got to this, ate the insides, and threw the shell aside. The otter doesn't need this shell. But boy, future abalone are going to need this shell, and so are all the other animals that have shells are going to need the ingredients here. So, given what we know about our marine protected areas right here and it being a no-take zone, imagine if you will, you're here at this beautiful place of Point Lobos. You're walking along the beach. You look down and, oh my goodness, you pick this up and you share this with your family and say, oh, there was this great home learning program by the you know, ports program of California State Parks and we learned all about this. This is an abalone shell and it's a flattened sea snail that eats the kelp and other animals will eat it like the otter. And you can go ahead and share all the information you know about this beautiful shell. You'd be welcome to pick it up, touch it, listen, maybe even smell it. Pass it around to your family and friends. But what would need to happen with this shell before you left that beach? Give you a moment to answer that. And go ahead and turn to whoever's in the room and answer. What would you do with this shell 
before you left the beach? Or just say the answer out loud if nobody's there. Yeah, excellent. That's right. You will leave this shell on the beach where you found it. Now I want you to think of maybe one or two reasons why we would wanna do that when we're in our marine protected areas that are a no take zone. What would be the reason? Give you a moment to think about that. All right, okay, excellent. The first reason, this is made up calcium carbonate, uh, the ingredients of a shell. This will slowly decompose and break apart. Add that ingredients right back into the ocean. So the waves will break it apart. It'll hit some rocks, maybe splinter a little bit, releasing its ingredients into the ocean. Hey, Daniel. Yes. Can you hear me? I'm underwater right now. Oh, excellent. We'll visit this uh, wonderful abalone yeah, shell. Yeah, no, I brought, I brought my very own abalone shell. I think mine's a little bit bigger than yours, though. I don't mean to compete oh over Zoom, but... <laughs> awesome. Abalone shell you... envy. <laughs> All right. Awesome. I don't know if you folks can see that. But yeah, uh, that no-take zone also applies here to the, to the aquarium here, Daniel. So, you know, we've got these really cool shells here from the abalone, but... Um, uh, yeah, here, keep, keep doing whatever it is that, that you were doing. I'll stop interrupting. My apologies. Oh, that's one. All right. Um, I can finish up. Let's, let's uh, check in with you, Patrick, and what you're up to. Well, I, what I'm up to is pretty sweet right now, Daniel, because I am currently diving inside the Monterey Bay Aquarium Kelp Forest exhibit, and I can hear you over at Point Lobos right now, and that's pretty awesome. So I just want to give a huge shout out to all the tech team that's hanging out here in the room, and also who's in on this Zoom webinar. Uh, hey, everybody. It's Diver wow. Pat here underwater in the Kelp Forest, and I'm talking to you, Daniel. Here, I'll put, I'll put this abalone show awesome. right back down well, well, on the bottom. Bottom there. Swim by you in a leopard shark uh, say that again. Did I see a steep head swim by and a leopard shark also? Oh yeah, no, this is really one of the best places to be if you want to take a look at some animals, especially up close and personal here, Daniel. I've been a diver here on the Monterey Peninsula for a little bit over a decade now. I absolutely love diving at Whaler's Cove. It's really one of the most beautiful places that we have here locally. Absolutely stunning. And this kelp forest here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium is going to be very similar to the type of kelp forest that you find out there at Point Lobos, especially as it relates to uh, certain animals in here, in particular the leopard sharks, Daniel, because every time that I've seen a leopard shark diving has been at Point Lobos. I saw. I actually saw one at the beach there, right there along Whaler's Cove, uh, in pretty shallow, around 10 feet deep. Large female. She didn't want anything to do with my bubbly personality, so it's really fun to come here to the aquarium and have leopard sharks swim right up to me just like that. Uh, so, Daniel, what, what, what do you think we should do now that we're underwater here? Uh, just hold on one second, guys. <clears throat> We're having some technical difficulties with Daniel's video over there, but Pat, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the fish that you have swimming around you in the meantime. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, hello, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being there uh, over on social media. Hey, there's me. I can watch me right now. Actually, you know what, Scott? I'm going to talk about the fish. One of my favorite things to do in Zoom calls is to just stare at me myself the entire time on camera. So that's pretty sweet. Hey, there's me. Cool. There you are. Um, right. Yeah. But, but so, um, so. Who I have around me is an amazing community of organisms that we have out here in the Monterey Bay. And really, these fish species that we have around me are very particular to the Northeast Pacific. If you go diving uh, down off of South America in temperate waters, you're not going to see, even though there might be like kelp forests off of uh, Chile or, or Argentina, or if you're over in New Zealand or Australia and those kelp forests, you're not going to see the same type of community. The Monterey Bay is essentially the surf perch capital of the world. There are more different types of surf perch here than pretty much anywhere else. So around me are mostly surf perch right now. We've got a black surf perch right here, and Biotica jacksony. We've got a rainbow surf perch right here. We've also got striped surf perch over here next to me. So already three different surf perch species right here in front of you. We also have over here the ones with the white spot on the back. Those are known as opal eyes. They have brilliant blue eyes. 
hence the name. They're a type of sea chub. So, striped surf perch, opali right here. Opalis used to be one of those fish. Here's another sea chub right here. There's a half moon right there. Those are fish that used to be more Southern California species, but we find them locally here in abundance now. And uh, behind me, of course, we have the giant kelp. The giant kelp you'll see forming a canopy over a Point Lobos. We'll also see out there at Point Lobos some bull kelp. Slightly different, just has the one big bulb there. And also behind me on the left, you're gonna be seeing some woody stiped uh, algae. They look like little miniature trees that form the understory. Those those are going to be northern and southern sea palms, as they're known, Paragophora and Isenia. So, a whole community there. What's up? Who's that big, big, big right next to you, my friend? There's a giant that, fish next to you. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to ignore her just a little bit. The giant sea bass is hanging out right there next to me. And uh, the giant sea bass is one of those fish that is... Uh, <laughs> She's, she's a little bit ornery that we've changed up her protocol here at the aquarium. She used to be fed every time a diver came into the water here, hand-fed during the feeding shows. But recently we've been doing a lot more training with the giant sea bass to train her to swim into a stretcher that allows us to take her up out of the water to do health checks and especially to put her in a fresh water bath to help get rid of parasites. So something in the wild that would happen is you'd have other fish coming up and cleaning the giant sea bass. But here at the aquarium, you know, we have access to amazing animal care, so we can take the giant sea bass out of the water, give it a little bit of a spa treatment, and uh, so to do that, we're training the giant sea bass with her meal. So you saw her come over and act a little bit pouty just then, so that's what's going on. Uh, yeah. Hey, Patrick. Yes. I'm going to question that people may have, um, and they can ask them over social media. And we have Erica, um, who is here to uh, kind of, uh, you know, take a look at those questions and pass them along. Um, sure, that'd be we awesome. Can yeah. for a moment, Scott? Yeah. Hi, guys. It's Erica here. Hey, Erica. I, good to chat with you in the real kelp forest from my virtual kelp forest. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Um, my name is Erica Delamar. I'm the Marine Protected Area Outreach and Education Project Coordinator for California State Parks. And I am monitoring the questions coming in on social media. So I'm watching Monterey Bay Aquarium's Facebook page. I'm watching Ports Program Facebook page. And I want to say, first and foremost, happy birthday to Monterey Bay Aquarium. Yay, happy birthday. Best fishes for a happy birthday. Yeah. Fishes. So we've got a lot of folks who are wishing happy birthday to the aquarium. A lot of people excited about no take for the abalone, which was really good to see. A really good question just came in, and I wonder if Pat might be able to answer this because you're just talking about feeding your fish in the kelp forest exhibit. Elizabeth asks, can fish eat cooked squash? So we are in the month of Halloween. We're all preparing for the harvest. Can fish eat cooked squash and pumpkin? Oh, that's an excellent question, and you know, I would not, I would not know the specific answer to that. I imagine that the fish can eat it, certainly. Whether or not it should is a different question that I'm unfamiliar with. But you know, what we do here at the aquarium, and that's a great segue here, Erica, is we've got some restaurant quality sustainable seafood right here in this bucket. As you can see, the little fishies around me, all of our amazing kelp forest denizens, they know that earlier at 11.30, there was only one bucket when there should have been two because we we saved one extra bucket for this particular show. So maybe let's just throw out some of those bits of food. Ooh, there's a lot of, just for my tech team, there's a lot of feedback in my, oh, it's gone now, perfect. So uh, I'm just gonna hand out here some food, some chopped up squid, chopped up clam, chopped up little bits of fish here for our smaller mouth animals. It looks like the leopard sharks might be interested in coming over as well. 
And what we have in here is a restaurant quality sustainable seafood. If you're wondering what sustainable means, it means that you can harvest that seafood and there's still plenty the next year for the environment and for yourself. So it means that you can have your fish and eat them too. And we do that thanks to our Seafood Watch program. You may have heard about seafoodwatch.org and you know what kind of good sustainable seafood exists in your area. So I know it's not squash or, you know, Halloween themed candy corn or anything like that, but only the best for our fish here, Erica. Well, thank you for answering that very funny and I think pretty relevant question. Um, what other animals, so you said that you've got the, the leopard sharks in there with you and we see the black sea bass. Are there maybe some animals that we're not seeing on screen, Pat? Yes, there are some animals that you don't really see on screen most of the time, and actually some very, very cool critters uh, like to hide in the cracks and crevices in here. So if we had visitors here, you'd be able to stand right below where I'm diving right now, and you'd be able to look straight down and actually see a very large wolf eel. Uh, wolf eels are one of those members of the community that help take down the sea urchins and the other herbivore pressure out there. And so there's a big wolf eel right there. I'm looking at you. Hey. And uh, we also have in here a massive, massive lobster uh, that is growing up in the back, kind of a little, uh, little Easter egg for the divers that come into this exhibit. We also have in here some extremely large red sea urchins and abalone. Like uh, Daniel was mentioning before, some of those abalone have been in here uh, pretty much since we opened, or at least for a few decades growing up in here. Oh, yeah, so there are quite a few uh, quite a few animals that you don't really get to see normally, but uh, an integral part of that kelp forest ecosystem, same in the wild. If you go diving out there at Point Lobos, you could swim right over some of the coolest animals you've never seen because they're so well hidden or they're on a different time schedule than we are being nocturnal or during the day. So, yeah, hidden gems. Can't wait to open up again so you folks will be able to come and see them. Very awesome. Thank you, Pat. Well, um, I'm going to turn it back to Daniel because I am not seeing any other questions come in. Um, but okay. this is a reminder for our viewers, I'm having a look at the comments coming in on Facebook. So if you've got any questions, head on over to either Monterey Bay or to Ports Program Facebook page, and we will be looking for your questions there. Thanks. Awesome. Well, hey, Daniel. All right. How is it topside? Thank you were you, Erica. Four degree water. I'm currently swimming in a refrigerator right now. All right. Uh, and kelp thrives in that cold, nutrient-rich water. That, that's one of the reasons for its success. I know that when the water temperature gets too warm, like in other parts of the state, giant kelp stops growing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Above, uh, above about 68 degrees, the kelp will stop growing and above 70, it'll start deteriorating. So in lots of different areas, you really need that cold, nutrient rich water we talk about so much here along the coast. And really, it, uh, it, the success of the season kind of starts off in March and April, the early spring with the winds that blow from the north to the south. There's a lot of cool physics that happen. But effectively, you've got the north to south wind, you've got the rotation of the planet, and what that does is it creates this current that pushes surface water out away from the coast, the warm surface water, and it brings up cold, nutrient-rich water from deeper, which is why out to sea, you can often have extremely warm water in the you know upper 60s and 70s, where you might find bluefin tuna like we did earlier this year in the Monterey Bay. There were some bluefin tuna out out there in the California current, uh, but then near the coast, you end up having that cold water that comes up and that's filled with all the food that sinks out the rest of the year, helps power that entire ecosystem. And we're so fortunate here in the Monterey Bay to have that Monterey Submarine Canyon, where with the tides going in and out every day, we always get a little bit of that upwelling, a little bit of that water going up the canyon walls, coming up and starting to feed a little bit. So that's part of the reason why it's so productive here in this area, that canyon so close to the coast you end up having that tidal upwelling bringing up a little bit of nutrients all the time but then that that springtime wind is what sets us up so we got a little bit of that this year and it's nice and chilly now later in the year it's awesome awesome 
And I know that we've got the Carmel Submarine Canyon right off of Whaler's Cove here that eventually meets up with the Monterey Bay, uh, Bay uh, Canyon. Yeah, that, yeah that's... thousands of feet deep, like I believe like 6,000 feet deep or something. Yeah. Yeah, and if you watch during the during the year when the when the blue whales start showing up, I've seen some blue whales from Point Lobos. Uh, some of the most spectacular scenes that you know nearing sunset, uh, later on in the evening, you start seeing uh, that nice light. See the blue whale blows, and if you were to track where they were, they would be right there along the edges of those canyons. That's where the krill is hiding. That's where the fish are there to eat the krill. So having that proximity to really impressive underwater bathymetry as it's known so basically those mountain ranges and and canyons that are underwater having access to that it just creates a little bit of extra drama it, it changes how the currents move changes the habitat for animals to live in and that's something we learn a lot about especially with the kelp forest that you know the more structure there is structure just being you know rocks or kelp or just anything to hide inside on top of behind uh having the that structure is critical for animals to to live on so you know point lobos is one of those protected places but it's a critically important protected place as far as its proximity to so many cool features that animals rely on you know we often talk about these protected areas being like national parks uh, on land but there are also areas that are just as we have currently daniel a leopard shark just helping itself to the rest of the food bucket here being very very I love it. folks at home oh but, patrick that is too cool <laughs> Yeah. You know, when I come in here with a food bucket and I'm just talking to the camera, Daniel, it's like if the pizza delivery guy came in and started telling you how pizza was made. At some point, you're just like, OK, buddy, just give up the pie. Move on. Um, yeah, yeah, those protected that areas are, it, it's so crucial to protect the right spots. And that's part of the, the research that goes on. Part of what State Parks does, what the aquarium advocates for is protecting, conserving those environments that are critical to the animals and how they use them. Yeah, super important. All yeah, right. and then, it's oh, Eric you got another Eric. question? Yeah, I've got a couple more questions coming in through <laughs> Facebook. So um, one of the questions actually came through on YouTube, and that question is, how long do abalone live? Do you guys know the lifespan of abalone? It's a great question. Yeah, they can live over 20 years as far as I know. So several decades they can live off the coast. I don't know if they can. What, what do you oh. think, Daniel? Yeah. Was that Daniel? Yeah, I, I had heard uh, up to 27 years was. I yeah. heard that uh, 27 years was one of the oldest abalones known. You know. Yeah, and actually, uh, Daniel, I don't know if we've talked about this before. I did some research in college over at UC Santa Cruz about abalone and actually how otters change their behavior. In particular, out here, you'll find massive abalone shells here. I think now it's time to go back down to the bottom, and I'll go grab that abalone shell. But basically, in areas without sea otters, the abalone shells grow to be super massive, very rounded, because the abalone are out and about in the environment bumping into each other. And so you have, this is a really big abalone that we have. We have these big abalone shells here and they bump into each other. And so their shells become more and more rounded, more and more heavy and more vertical when there's no sea otters around like up on the North coast. But down in Monterey, you can have an abalone that's the same width, the same length, but then it's incredibly flat because all the abalone is doing is living inside the crack, eating drift kelp that comes to it. And the minute that it crawls out is when the otter comes over, takes it up off the rock and eats it. So you don't really have an opportunity in the sea otter range to get big and fat and rounded with your shell because you, the minute you crawl out of that crack, an otter is going to come and nab you. And so, you know, when we're diving up Point Lobos, there's so many massive, massive shells. But if you take a closer look at them, you'll notice they're not huge and humped and rounded. They're nice and flat fitting in that crack until they crawl out. That's called predator mediated behavioral change or a fancy way of saying if there's something scary outside, you don't go outside a whole lot. Uh, and so that's what happens with abalone shells. And you can tell from the research that I did 
Whether or not the abalone shell that you found comes from an area that had sea otters or did not have sea otters when that abalone was alive. Really, really Super cool awesome. animal. And abalone, by the way, I'm sure you mentioned this, but if, if people are just tuning in, a massive, massive snail. Big snail. This is the largest abalone species in the world is the California red abalone there. Coleotis rufescens. Amazing animal. Oh, well, that is some really great information about the abalone that we find in our kelp forests here along Central California. And actually, some of the information you're presenting is related to the next question that we have. And the next question is about the sea otters. And we had a couple of people asking, can you explain the role that the sea otters play in the kelp forest? Absolutely. Daniel, do you want to take the uh, first half of that? And then I'll Absolutely. take the rest. Absolutely. Well, what it, what's been observed and learned over the years is that the, the sea otter's diet affects the, the kelp forest, like this abalone. It's a kelp eater. The sea urchin, it's a kelp eater. So the otter, if it's not around to eat those animals, like the abalone and the urchin, they'll eat the kelp. And that's what was found out here in Point Lobos after the otter hunters came through in the early parts of the 1800s. When pioneers came, you know, a number of years later, when they arrived at what is now Point Lobos, uh, they did not see kelp or otters. The hunters had already gone, gone through here, taken the otters out, and then as a subsequent, the, the kelp's predators, the otters, prey, uh, you know, uh, ate all the kelp and either had to adapt, migrate somewhere else, or die. Um, so... The otter has a really important role in the kelp itself and the structures of the kelp forest. And Patrick, please add on to that. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, you absolutely, those sea otters, that top predator in the kelp, so crucial for the health of everything else. You know, we often think, okay, if there's, you know, more wolves or more bears, does that mean that the, that the, that their prey is going to go away? And there's this balance that, that works out where the more predators you have because there's more prey, it kind of keeps everything in check. And so when you remove the predator, the prey will start overgrazing its resources and then it can lead to those issues where you may have heard of urchin barons or other things where without those gardeners without somebody coming in and tending making sure everything's kind of looking good then you can have certain ecosystem changes like uh, a very warm year or a bad year for kelp a good year for sea urchins that can throw everything out of whack what we've really learned over all of the decades of science looking at ecosystems is that the more players there are in the environment the more of everybody on the field there is, the better the game is played and it's not lopsided in any direction. You need all the players on the field. And that also goes for people in our communities. The more voices, the more people participate, the better it is for everybody. And so in the kelp forest, same thing. Those sea otters are crucial gardeners of that kelp. One of the coolest facts that I learned about is that this relationship between the giant kelp behind me and sea otters that's been going on for six to eight million years here along the coast is that the otters are eating those urchins and those grazers and the kelp therefore is able to grow and doesn't have to worry so much about producing these chemicals inside of it that make it not tasty. So it can uh, give more of itself to growing, more of itself to propagating. If you were to try to feed kelp from New Zealand to one of our sea urchins here, it'd be disgusting. They don't like to eat it because that kelp has evolved without sea otters. And so they're in a chemical war with each other, uh, the kelp and the sea urchins trying to be able to handle how disgusting you are, trying to become more disgusting, whereas our giant kelp is essentially a, a delicious morsel because the sea otter has been able to basically take that role away from the kelp. Kelp doesn't have to worry about being so untasty because the otter is there. And so when you remove the otter, you change six to eight million years of relationships that have been going on. And we're noticing some of those effects up and down the coast. The aquarium's been doing research with sea otters since even before we were open, over 37 years now. 
And we found uh, from releasing those otters into areas where there weren't any, that they're starting to garden in that zone and they're bringing back eelgrass beds and Elkhorn slough, and they're helping with the resilience of the kelp in our area. So it's a really amazing relationship. And Daniel, when people go visit Point Lobos, they get to see sea otters right there, but that's kind of like seeing like a Siberian tiger in a sense. There's only about 3,000 here. Along the coast of California, you go from Pigeon Point down to the Channel Islands, that's it. That's all the otters, the southern sea otters. So Point Lobos has them floating on the surface. We have them around the corner there, but this is what they help produce for, for us, not only this beauty, but the habitat for all of these fish, all of the ecosystem services, the economy of the area, just sea otters are crucial. And so it, it's really cool. If you come to the aquarium, head over to Point Lobos after, you'll be able to see sea otters. And this is what they're helping guard in there, caretaking. Awesome. Wow. Yeah, amazing what, any, what the sea otters do. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Wow. Yeah, you know, um, by the way, Daniel, now that I'm done, like feeding, I could do the rest of the show upside down, if that's better for everybody. <laughs> All right. Isn't this guy fun? You know, Can I do on, that? Guys. Okay, no, here, I'll just come back this <laughs> way. Right. I love it. All right. Awesome. Very cool. Well, I have another question. Um, thank you guys so much, Pat. I know it's really hard to talk underwater with all that gear, um, but you are doing a fantastic job of sharing some really interesting information. I feel like I'm learning some stuff today too, which is really great. So um, one of the Ports fans um, on Ports Facebook page, um, she asked, why is the Pacific Ocean so cold? And um, since we were just talking about otters, maybe we can talk about how the otters are adapted to live in cold water. Oh, yeah, that's a great question here. I'll, I'll start here. Well, our area is cold in part because of the upwelling that happens when the winds are blowing, brings up that cold, nutrient-rich water, but it's also cold because of other currents that are moving around. If you look up uh, on Google, you'll, you can find oceanographic general currents that go all the way around, and so there's cold currents and warm currents that compete with each other, and the west coast of continents tend to have a lot of cold water that's coming in to those to those areas as it relates to sea otters sea otters are incredibly well adapted to living in the cold environment but they're not as well adapted as say a seal or a dolphin or a whale is in that they don't have that blubber i don't know daniel do you want to explain to the folks the incredible dry suit that sea otters have available to them oh my goodness Yes, uh, sea otters have incredibly dense, thick fur. Um, folks who have studied have studied just even a square inch where there could be up to a million hairs in one square inch of the sea otter's, you know, total, you know, body. And it's so dense, you know, that people, that's why they were hunted. But it's still not necessarily dense enough to keep them completely warm. They blow in little bubbles to help insulate themselves from the water as well. So that's, that, that fur is, is, is super helpful, but then they insulate themselves a, a bit with um, blowing some bubbles in, in, and they eat a lot of food. And that's why places like Point Lobos and other marine protected areas are so important because of the no-take zone. There's going to be food for these animals to eat and they have to eat about 25% of their body weight every day, every day. Every day, I mean, food. that's, I, 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 there's so many different numbers out there, but I think it's something like 40 hamburgers every day, you know, like it's some, it's some ridiculous number. And that's just the power of that miniature furnace there that's, what, that's out there in the kelp. When you see a sea otter wrapped up in the kelp, it may look like it's lazy, just kind of enjoying its day. But think about that as being like downtime in this incredible athlete trying to dive down and find enough food. Imagine trying to find, if you weigh 100 pounds, trying to find 25 pounds of food every single day that's that's a lot that's a lot of meat that you're trying to get on your on your bones and these otters live in very slim energy margins basically they really can't miss out on certain certain uh 
meals or anything or things can start spiraling. So if you're out there kayaking, that's another reason for why you want to leave those sea otters alone. Because if you mess with their mess with their flow, and I'm sure you folks out there who've been quarantined at home, you know that if, if something changes out of your particular uh, of your particular routine, it could throw off the rest of the day. Well, think about that with sea otters, where they need to groom, they need to dive and eat and sleep, all in that order to keep everything going well. So that's another thing if you're out here exploring along Cannery Row over at Point Lobos and you see an otter, leave them alone. They're already already doing a ton of work that day. You see them sleeping, but that's actually their rest time between the sprints and the marathons that they're having to pull off here to survive here along along this coast in that cold, cold water. I mean, my, my fingers are starting to go a little bit numb already. I've only been in the water I don't know how long. My wetsuit is only good for a certain amount of time. So, you know, you think about all this technology that I have on all this gear, all this engineering, and I'm like mildly comfortable for about an hour. Imagine living your entire life out there in the water. It's a lot of work and respect to those sea otters and the rest of the animals doing it every day. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, and um, that reminds me of something that happened this morning. I was leading a group of fourth graders with our ports program out on Whalers Cove like we did last week for our, for our program, and what was really interesting is that they had just read The Island of the Blue Dolphins, which is a, a, a really incredible tale of the sea otter hunters and, and, um, and the Native Americans um, in the southern part of our state. And uh, the students, of course, wanted to see sea otters. And when I got into Whalers Cove today, there were a few on the far side of the cove. And I did everything I possibly could to avoid them. In fact, <laughs> going there, they got to understand we didn't want to get so close. They were, they were just immersed in that blue island of the blue dolphins. They know what happened to the otters. And so it was a real powerful learning experience about learning how to stay away from the otters and the place to see them in the wild is trails here on the cliffs with some binoculars, you know, looking down on them in their natural habitat. Second best, of course, is the aquarium. Absolutely. Yeah, so crucial to know how to behave out here, seeing those animals in their natural habitat. It's really such a treat to have those organisms out here it just really doing is. their thing. It's awesome. So one of the questions that has come in from um, Catherine, who's watching on Facebook, um, Catherine asked if um, the otters would be welcome into the kelp forest exhibit at the aquarium. Now, <laughs> we know that those otters, they obviously oh. need to eat a lot. Uh, <laughs> what do you think would happen if you had an otter in the kelp forest exhibit there in the aquarium hat? Well, we would have to close down for several years more uh, with the destruction that one otter in this exhibit would would uh, would create. Sea otters are incredibly curious. They're obviously very hungry. They have to go after and find a whole bunch of food. And curiosity mixed with a large weasel leads to destruction. And so at the aquarium, we have the sea otters. The, all of our sea otters at the aquarium are rescued sea otters that would not survive in the wild on their own. Um, so over in our sea otter exhibit, you'll see them over there, but in the Cal Forest exhibit, they would just tear it apart trying to find where we've hidden all of the tasty clams and abalone that must be in here. So we don't have any sea otters in here, Erica, but we have had one sea otter in here previously, and that's Rosa, our wonderful, lovely lady who just turned 21 this year. Um, Rosa is over in the sea otter exhibit, and she was in here back when she was a rescued otter. Um, up above this kelp forest, we have some holding pools for rescued sea otters. The Monterey Bay Aquarium Sea Otter Program helps take care of stranded sea otter pups and other otters that need help out there along the coast. They come here, we've got some enclosures upstairs where those otters hang out. And so Rosa was up there hanging out and um, somebody went in and fed her. And then the latch just didn't quite get closed one day. And so she, you know, very interestingly like, oh cool, there's a little gap, let me open that up. Oh cool, now there's a little, little deck I'm going to take a nap on and then when she woke up it's like okay well I could go into this smaller pool over here with some walls or I see kelp right over here so let me just let me just dive on in and so Rosa just 
jumped into the Cal Forest to swimming around. Now, in front of the Cal Forest exhibit, we were open at the time. Imagine you're a volunteer guide, one of the docents that we have at the aquarium. And I'm looking out this way. The kelp is behind me. And a visitor comes up to the volunteer and says, hey, when did you put sea otters in the kelp forest? Of course, the volunteer knows that there's no sea otters in the kelp forest, so she naturally just says, oh, actually, no, there's no sea otters in the kelp forest. They're right over here at the main entrance, just right around the corner. The visitor looks at her very confused and goes, well, so there's no sea otters in, in this exhibit. And the volunteer goes, no, no, there's no sea otters. They're right over at the front. We don't have them. And explains the entire reason that I just gave you. And after hearing that, the, vol the visitor just looks at the volunteer and goes, well, what's that then? And then the volunteer finally turns around, looks up, and there's Rosa just chilling, having a ball, swimming around on the surface, diving down, taking a closer look. Once we found that out, the volunteer quickly called to the sea otter program, sea otter program staff go upstairs, called Rosa over to the side, she swam over, swam into her net, back into her back into her, her enclosure, just feeling like she was the, the smartest girl of the bunch, and she certainly was that day. So that's our otterly possum little story about the one time there was a sea otter in the Kelp Forest. That is great. Oh, rascal. Really funny story, Pat. Um, another question came in from Martin, and Martin asked, are you able to teach the otters how to hunt uh, when they're living there in the aquarium? I know that sometimes you guys have rescued otter pups. Can you speak a little bit about the husbandry that you do with the otters? Yeah, so that's a really, really cool story. We had an otter back in the day, Tula, who came in at the aquarium, and she unfortunately had a stillborn pup. She was pregnant with a pup that didn't make it uh, during birth. But then right at the same time, there was a brand new newborn pup that stranded, not her pup, uh, and it came to the aquarium. So there's this opportunity to put a, a mother-to-be and a young pup that was recently orphaned together, and they bonded, and they were able to form this connection that now sustains our sea otter surrogacy program to this day. It turns out that sea otter females are very maternal, especially if their needs are met here at the aquarium. Plenty of food, no predators, very safe space for these otters to feel like they can take care of a pup. And so since Tula, back in the day, we've now been able to rescue over a hundred of these stranded pups and release them back out there into the wild. And and so we here at the aquarium have a very minimal hands-on work with these young pups. We wear a dark face mask and a poncho to disguise the human form. We don't talk to them and we take care of the pups up until they're old enough to eat some solid food and then they go with one of our exhibit females who will then teach the otters all the sea otter 101 that they need, how to groom, how to dive, how to get their meals. And so those otters go through that surrogacy program with otters teaching otters so if you're a fan of our sea otter cam here at the aquarium, you'll sometimes see some of the girls going in and off of being in the exhibit behind the scenes. And that's when they're taking care of those stranded pups or acting as a companion to those other animals. So we let the otters teach the otters what to do. But, you know, on our on our birthday here, our 36 year anniversary, we should acknowledge that back in the day, there were people who got to dive in the ocean out here with sea otter pups carrying the pup around on their belly and trying to teach them how to die back in the 80s before we knew any of that stuff. And the photos are awesome. It didn't work so good for the otters, but kind of it kind of makes me wish like, hey, you know, back in the 80s, I could have swam with some sea otter pups. But I'm glad we know the good science now and the otters are doing better helping garden that kelp and return the ecosystem resilience that we once had along the coast. But pretty cute back in the day. Got to die with those otters. Wow, really awesome story, Pat. Well, hey, um, we, we're still continuing to get questions, but I want to be respectful of the time that you've been underwater. I know you're in cold water right now, and it can be a little bit difficult to talk in that mask. So um, maybe it's time to head back up to the surface, Pat, and um, we'll kick it back over to Daniel at Point Lobos, and we'll see you above water in a couple minutes. Sounds good. Yeah, I'll join you back on the phone. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for hanging out with me underwater here in the kelp. I'll see you upstairs. Thanks, Daniel. Thank and Erica, you, talk Patrick. to you soon. All right. Wow. What an experience. My goodness. Getting a chance to see inside of a kelp forest and then getting to learn all that great stuff 
about all the residents that are there and the interconnections. One thing that really stood out to me about Patrick's uh, experience there um, was when he said all the players, there needs to be a, a bunch of different players. Um, you know, they all need to be represented. And what that reminded me of is a, a very old saying, you know, variety is the spice of life. But then to add on to that, nature delights in that variety. And when we look at a place like Point Lobos or even the, the Kelp Forest Aquarium at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, we're given an insight to what those areas look like in the biodiversity, the different animals that are there, which is super exciting and helps to uh, build up the strength and fortify these places. The, um, the, what I have learned is the more uh, different life forms, the more different biodiversity, the stronger an area is to be able to battle whatever may come up against it. And here at Point Lobos, it being a California State Park, as well as a marine protected area, are afforded very high protections. And so we get a chance to experience that biodiversity. Now, one thing I wanna share with you real quick before Patrick comes back and says goodbye is you know, some of the life forms that we get a chance to see. Um, let me go ahead and I'm gonna share our screen really quick. Last week, you might recall towards the end of our time together, we came across this curious creature right here. It looked like a mermaid finger or something like that. Um, well, I did a little bit of research. What we discovered last week in the kelp forest here at Whalers Cove was the sea pickle. It's a free floating colonial tunicate, um, uh, you know, uh, more specifically a pyrosome. And it's a filter feeder taking in plankton as it floats along. Now, those of you who were just listening said, Daniel just said that that was a colonial animal and I only see one. I'm glad you were paying attention. It obviously broke off from its colony, but they can be in huge colonies of the hundreds. So the sea pickle, every day there's something new to learn in the kelp forest and in our environment in general. So I wanted to follow up with that since we found that at the very end of our program last week. And um, I wanted to share with this cool critter called the sea pickle. Now, my sources tell me that this, there's a sea pickle in the game Minecraft. I won't pretend to know about that, but those of you who are into Minecraft might be able to support that, that that's a character in that particular uh, uh, computer game. All right. Wow, that's really now, cool, Daniel. Um, there's so much really wild life uh, spread throughout our world's ocean, and I feel like there's always so much more to discover. And there are scientists who are discovering new species in our ocean all the time. And one of the places that, uh, that they are discovering a lot of new life is in the deep sea. You mentioned earlier that you have a submarine canyon near Point Lobos, don't you? I, we sure do. In fact, um, yeah, there's all kinds of cool life there. And Erica, I'm really glad that you brought that up because I know something that you worked on that was important and super cool that I want you all to know about. It is my favorite new app. It's through Time Looper, everybody. And it's called Dive Into Point Lobos. You can get it in your app store or on Google Play, and it will take you into the world of Point Lobos Kelp Forest, talking about that. Uh, oh, and look, it, isn't that fun? <laughs> there, there, right there. All right. Uh, Thank you for that plug, Daniel. That certainly wasn't out. what I was going for. <laughs> but hey, um, dive into Point Lobos. But it was perfect. <laughs> right. a, great, a great segue. Just <laughs> utilizing technology to explore our world. And um, we can do that with 360 photos and augmented reality now with the Dive into Point Lobos app. So make sure that you guys download it. It's available on both uh, for iPhone and for Android. But hey, it looks like Pat is out of the water, guys. Do you want to say hi to Pat now I that saw. he's back without his gear on? I am, yeah. Hey, everybody. So a hey, little, bit, little bit of a chillier uh, me than a little bit before. But yeah, just coming out from inside the exhibit <laughs> here. We've got, uh, we've got Justin actually somewhere back there. Justin was my dive buddy, making sure I had plenty of air and that you could hear me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, Daniel, I mean, I, I don't want to gloss over the fact that that was pretty sweet, that I was underwater just then talking to you uh, remotely. It's pretty amazing how far uh, we've come as far as being able to be connected um, with, uh, with all the different technologies here. But 
I just think what's so cool is that these stories of the kelp forest, how important these environments are, uh, they've been important to people who have been living here for tens of thousands of years uh, before, you know, the aquarium was here, before Cannery Row was here, before the Chinese fishing village that were built on top of was here, you know, the 1800s, pretty, pretty recent as far as the amount of time that people have been here um, and uh, thriving thanks to this kelp forest thriving as well. And so I, I just think that in this moment where, you know, things have changed so quickly for so many things, you know, I wish I could just be there right there next to you right now um, talking about this stuff, but um, it's just really important to remind ourselves that the people that are alive today depend on these ecosystems the same as people who did back in the day. We're, in, we're intimately connected to these environments and this kelp forest out here is what makes our coast so special. Everything is so connected to the health of that kelp, the health of that ocean ecosystem. All those players include people. We've been a part of this ecosystem this whole time. And so it's part of our, our, our mission here, our role here. If we're trying to conserve the ocean, trying to make sure people can see what they have on this planet that they're sharing with uh, is to remind ourselves of the people that have been here, that are still here, um, that have been in communion with this community for tens of thousands of years. And with all of us that are here now, going forward, knowing that we're deeply connected to the health of this environment right here. And it's my just absolute pleasure and honor to be able to dive uh, in that kelp forest and show off some of the cool things that we have here at the aquarium, knowing that the ocean is full of even more uh, amazing life right out here off our coast. Awesome. Patrick, it's always a pleasure. So thank you so much for, for taking us into that world right there. And, and you have, this has changed a lot of people's perspective. There's no doubt about it. I mean, what a big wow that was. You know? Oh, that's awesome. And, thank you, Daniel. And it's, uh, yeah, and it's up to us. You and every we spoke about it, you know, in the past, people have depended upon them. In the present, people are depending upon this ecosystem. But in the future, we are too. And that's what this work is yes. so important. Is, you know, here we're partnering up with the aquarium um, and uh, sending it out through our county office of education and through our computer using educators through Monterey Bay and, and, and sharing the message, sharing this information. And for you viewers, please don't let this stop right here. Share your experience day with others. Uh, Point Lobos is open, and you can come and visit Point Lobos. Um, it would be great for you to experience um, the, the kelp forest right here from our trails. Um, and when the aquarium opens, the, the lines are going to be huge. <laughs> you <know? Yeah. laughs> we know it. <laughs> you know? We know Certainly. It. Yeah, no, it's definitely, you know, uh, we definitely look forward to be able to reopen up uh, for everybody here very soon. Uh, hope that everybody out there who's been watching has been staying safe. Uh, and hopefully this was a, a fun little moment to learn a little bit more about the kelp. And yeah, um, go see it if you can. Join us remotely here and watch what we've got there. But uh, Daniel, so much fun to be able to share uh, share what we've got here with, with everybody tuning in today, everybody tuning in on social media, uh, the ports program, distance learning, everybody out there. Uh, really fun to be able to just learn a little bit about some kelp. It's always a good time. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Patrick, again, thank you so much. And I know you might have to, you know, maybe go get warm or something. Feel free to hang out if you'd like. But, um, you know, if you need to go change or something, please feel free. Um, I want to remind our viewers next week, though, that we will be visiting the aquarium again. And we'll be uh, meeting up with Mary Whaley, who is in charge of the uh, uh, education. Monterey, what else the Monterey Bay Aquarium does in, it, in educating us about the marine resources that are here. So that'll be next Wednesday at 9 a.m. All right. Um, so we're going to continue our, our series with our third and final installment of Above and Under Monterey Bay. A few other things I want to share with you. Um, of course, that dive into Point Lobos app we just spoke about is hot off the digital presses. So get yours now. It is absolutely amazing. Um, the, the photography, the video, the video and, and the information, I think you're all going to really enjoy. Uh, I also would like to you know, just share our um, website with you, our Ports website. It's ports-ca.us all kinds of digital content there related to our California state parks. Um, there's ways to uh, sign up for our ports programs on that uh, website there. So that's ports, P-O-R-T-S dash C-A dot U-S. 
And with that, I just want to thank all the behind the scenes people who made this incredible day happen. Um, we got a chance to check out above the uh, kelp forest last week, and this week we jumped into that kelp forest and got to learn a little bit more. Uh, got to learn a lot more about that giant kelp forest. Um, so Scott and 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 uh, and uh, Scott Webster and Scott Shepard and everybody else behind the scenes, Erica, thank you so much for uh, making this all happen. Again, my name is California State Park Daniel, and I am at Point Lobos State Natural Reserve. I remind you next week that we'll be here at Point Lobos and the Aquarium for a dual field trip on Wednesday, the 28th of October at 9 a.m. And with that, kind of just say, wave a goodbye and good big goodbye, kind of move our camera over a little bit. We're a little bit far from the ocean, but let's go ahead and, and take a quick walk over there to say goodbye. Thank Sounds you again for, for joining everyone. All right. All right, so here we go. This is awesome, Daniel. I love just walking along with you over here to go take a look at, at the bay. Awesome. Awesome. Here we go. And now that we're on the trail, I'll pop on my mask, but there you go. Whaler's Cove before your very eyes. Hey, hey, Pat and Daniel, yep. um, before we sign off, I was wondering if each of you could share your one conservation tip. If someone were to come to visit the shoreline of Point Lobos or shoreline of Monterey Bay from out of town and maybe they weren't familiar with it, what would you recommend they do to help us protect the wildlife that lives here? Well, uh, what I just got a uh, plug real quick. I know that the deadline for registering to vote for California was yesterday, but if you are a registered voter in California, make sure that you are involved politically because these uh, marine protected areas, these uh, state marine reserves, all those things, those came together because of the fishing communities, local communities, all voting, working together on legislation to try to make those things a reality. They don't just kind of show up because they're good ideas. There's a lot of work that happens in a lot of different meeting rooms, lots of different stakeholders. So just become a voter, get involved with your local community. We happen to have an election coming up right now, but that applies all the time. When the aquarium opened in 1984, this was not the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. That shows up in 1992 and in large part has to do with people becoming aware of what's out there underwater. The marine protected areas that we have a system of in California, many of those were set up in the early 2010s. Very new uh, to our coast, but critical um, to, to be thought about at, at, your, at your local legislation level. So if you're coming to visit, whether you're from out of town, here in California, along the coast, get involved with your local community because that's how those things end up end up happening. Those protected areas are from you to your to your leadership. So get involved. Awesome. Yeah, it's up to us absolutely to make sure places like this always remain and exist. And yeah, and vote absolutely. And another uh, advice I would give to uh, visitors here is make sure that you take responsible for your stuff for your water bottle, for that little wrapper corner that you tear off that ends up on the trail and then out into the kelp forest. That's something that's all in our control, everyone, is taking responsibility for the things that we have here in our possession and they, they end up in the trash or in the recycling and they don't end up where we all know that they shouldn't be. And that's attainable. That is something that we can do. All right. right. And it takes working together, just like Patrick was saying, you know, it, it takes a lot of people coming together to realize, hey, this is important. And I need to make sure that this, this you know, this uh, bottle cap gets to where it needs to go or whatever the case may be. So when you're here exploring and enjoying, please, you know, drink your water, but make sure that that water bottle leaves here with you. Exactly right, Daniel. Yeah. You know, the two things that we just mentioned is, is it's two parts of the same continuum where understanding that you as an individual are very powerful, not only in the impact that you might have directly on an environment, if you go off trail, if you, um, if you forget you know, your trash somewhere, that has a direct impact. It's not, it's not just something that happens at, at a distance. And also you're very powerful as an individual when you're connected to everybody else that's working towards the same thing. So that small level 
uh, of your own individual responsibility. It's important to know there. And then that goes all the way up to your individual responsibility with a larger group to work together um, to help protect these environments. So it's the same continuum. It's not like two separate things there. So yeah, exactly. I really appreciate exactly. that. Exactly. I have a big smile under my mask. I love what you're saying. <laughs> same here. <laughs> all right. Yeah, Great. Well, Aquarium recently uh, just released one of their pages is Vote for the Ocean. And it's got a little bit of a voter's guide um, and ways that you can take action to end plastic pollution, to take action on climate change. Uh, to support sustainable fisheries. So Monterey Bay Aquarium has all of that information on one page. I went ahead and I popped it into the chat on the Facebook feed, but for those of you who are tuning in, if you go to montereybayaquarium.org and search vote for the ocean, you'll find the page with all the resources you need. But really great tips, you guys. Thank you so much for all the knowledge that you've shared with us. Thank you to all our Facebook audiences and those of you who joined us on the Zoom webinar. We are so appreciative that you're here with us today and hopefully we'll see you soon for uh, the next week's Port Ports Home Learning Program, the part three of this series. So thank you guys so much. It's been lovely and uh, we'll see you next week. All right, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Erica. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, everybody. This was so Bye, much fun. Bye, everyone.